Believers. No, you stay here. I'm in charge. Do you feel in charge? Guys, we love to hate, or in some cases, we just hate. Whatever the case, they are an integral part of the hero's story. After all, if there's a hero, there's got to be a villain. There's a school of thought that says a hero is only as good as his villain. After all, who cares about a hero if the person he overcomes, his arch nemesis, is lame, right? You might not agree with that 100%. It's not always 100% true, but for the most part, we need a good bad guy. So on the treatment today, we deconstruct the antagonist. We're giving the bad guys the treatment. So for this treatment, we're primarily going to focus on movies and television, but um, some of these, uh, well, the analysis will work for literature in terms of novels and comic books also. And we're also going to focus on a few examples to make the points clear. So let's go. Right, so creating a villain 101. The first and most obvious point is the image of the villain. Some of the most iconic villains gained their iconic status before they even did anything. Just because they look and sound the part. One of the most obvious examples is Darth Vader. This intro scene in Star Wars A New Hope is classic. All he did was show up look around and continue walking but immediately you knew he was the bad guy it also helps at times if the villain has a quirk something that makes him stand out in the case of Darth Vader apart from his look his breathing other examples include Bane from The Dark Knight Rises with his weird mask also and a uh, really weird sounding voice. Take control. Take control of your city. In terms of appearance, pretty much every monster out there falls in this category. Monsters just look bad. And sound bad too. Another example is also in the Star Wars universe. This one from episode 1, The Phantom Menace, Darth Maul. He really looks bad. His quirk, his double edge lightsaber, or lightsaber staff. And that's pretty much it as far as Darth Maul is concerned. Unlike Vader, 
he didn't really do anything to justify his status as iconic villain. Yeah, he killed Qui-Gon, but that's pretty much it. He didn't really do anything else. He just looked really badass. And fine, his fighting was badass also. But is looking and sounding the part enough to make an antagonist memorable? Is that really all you have to do? Well, in most cases, no. The antagonist has to live up to his look or sound. Besides, the premise of some of the most classic villains is that they actually do not look or sound like a villain, at least when you first see him. So what exactly makes a villain epic in the first place? What are we trying to achieve anyway? Well, it boils down to two basic things. When you make a villain, you want people to one, be afraid of him, and two, to respect him. Fear and respect. A truly epic villain commands these two things. All right, so I did mention that in some cases, heroes have been able to thrive even with weak villains. Uh, for example, look no further than the movie adaptations of all the Marvel characters, okay? Um, I'm talking about the mo movies made by Marvel Studios and by other studios who own the rights to some of these Marvel characters. In all of those movies, there's probably been about only three truly classic villains that are really good. Um, <clears throat> I'm talking about Loki from Thor and the Avengers, obviously. Um, there's Magneto from the X-Men movies. And uh, before that, you have to go way back to Blade 2 with Nomad, because he was pretty terrifying, scary, and you respected him. Uh, the rest, uh, there's some good ones, not truly outstanding, and there's some really average ones. Uh, good ones like uh, Obadiah Stane from Iron Man 1, um, La Magra or Deacon Frost from Blade 1, um, and Doc Ock from Spider-Man 2, and probably the Green Goblin despite his um, Power Rangers outfit from Spider-Man 1. Uh, you know, and the others, there are a few other ones that are kind of good and some average and some just really bad or extremely forgettable. So it remains to be seen what they're going to do with Thanos. Um, he's had some nice cameos and we're keeping our fingers crossed on um, Ultron. Uh, Avengers 2 comes out, there's a lot of buzz and we hope they get him right. But despite uh, the weak villains that a lot of these movies have, some of them are really still very good movies. Two great examples. Guardians of the Galaxy. Awesome movie. Really cool. But, you know, the villain doesn't really live up to expectations. We'll discuss why in a bit. And then there's Captain America the Winter Soldier. Bucky was awesome. But technically, he really wasn't a villain. I mean, the real villain was Robert Redford as Alexander Pierce. And forgettable. Didn't do justice to such an actor. Or, yeah, you know what I mean. Anyway, uh, these movies were still really good. But you can't help but feel that, you know, maybe they would have been even better if the villains were, like, more epic. I can say that for Guardians of the Galaxy. As good as it was, if the villain was a bit more epic, I think I'd like it even more. All right, that's my rant. But beyond appearance, how do you generate fear and respect? How do you make a truly epic villain? Well, there are a number of ways to do that. One of the most widely used methods is to make the audience or the viewers connect with the villain by showing the evolution of that villain. Why does the villain do what he or she does? What are the circumstances that made them into who or what they are? Most of the time, we're talking about an origin story. And this was done extremely well with Loki in Thor. We get to see why or how he slowly becomes 
what he is. In fact, in the movie Thor, if anything, at the end of the movie, we understand why Loki is what he is. Yeah, he's a bad guy. But we also realize that Odin is a douchebag. I mean, seriously. Who kidnaps his enemy's son, raises him as his own, and pretends like he actually has the possibility of becoming king when you have no intention of doing so? Way to go, Odin. You screw with his head, and when he confronts you, what do you do? You go to sleep. Classic. Why would you take me? You were an innocent child. No, you took me for a purpose. What was it? Tell me! I thought we could unite our kingdoms one day, bring about an alliance, bring about a permanent peace through you. But those plans no longer matter. So I am no more than another stolen relic, locked up here until you might have use of me. Why'd you twist my words? You could have told me what I was from the beginning. Why didn't you? You're my son. I wanted only to protect you from the truth. What? Because I, I, I am the monster that parents tell their children about at night? No. You know, it all makes sense now why you favored Thor all these years. Because no matter how much you claim to love me, you could never have a frost giant sitting on the throne of Asgard. What is this newfound love for the Frost Giants? You could have killed them all with your bare hands. I've changed. So have I. Now fight me. I never wanted a throne! I only ever wanted to be your equal. I will not fight you, brother! I'm not your brother. I never was. Loki, this is madness. Is it madness? Is it? Is it? Come on, what happened to you on Earth that turned you so soft? Don't tell me it was that woman. Oh, it was. Well, maybe when we're finished here, I'll pay her a visit myself. This was also done very well with Magneto. more extensively in X-Men First Class. Where we get to see in detail how exactly Eric Lentra becomes Magneto. Now here's the thing with this method. It often involves telling the origin story of the villain. Most movies have to center around the heroes but it also has to be a general plot, some scheme that the bad guy is doing. So you don't have the luxury of doing this origin story or doing it well. However, this method seems to be the preferred method for a lot of the Marvel movies. For example, every single Spider-Man movie, including the reboots, without exception, uses this method. with uh, varying degrees of success. There is one final drawback with this method. It's already been hinted upon. 
the reason why we sometimes root for the villain. When we get to know them too well, we lose the fear factor. So even when it's done properly, this could be a problem. For example, we like Loki, but do we still fear him? Not quite sure. For Magneto, on the other hand, he doesn't have that problem. Even though we know him, we definitely still respect him, and the fear factor is definitely still there. But what do we do when you don't have time for an origin story for your villain? This is a problem that the superhero subgenre faces a lot. Uh, they feel they have to do an origin story. Which is why you end up with a, a random symbiote falling from the sky and just jumping on Spider-Man's back. Or a guy running through the forest escaping from prison and falling into a vat of swirling sand, which we never see again. We don't know why there's swirling sand, he just falls into it and he becomes a villain. Uh, hey, it's a problem. Um, luckily, action movies and uh, television series, uh, even the superhero ones, don't have that much pressure to do it. The TV series have enough time to do an origin if they want to, and the action movies, they find a way. They don't have to explain why the bad guy is a bad guy. He just needs, or she just needs, to fit or fulfill their role properly. So it's definitely possible to make the viewers connect with a villain without doing an origin story. And guess what? Even the superhero movies have been able to pull it off. Remember, making the viewers connect with a villain is secondary. It is not a necessity. What is, is making sure they fear and respect your villain. And doing this boils down to two things. There are two ways. You either show, or number two, you tell. But most of the time, it has to be a combination of both. Either you show, then tell, or you tell, then show. Or you show and tell at the same time. Let's look at a great example of showing. In this one intro scene, we come to fear and respect Hans Landa, the Jew hunter, played by Christopher Waltz. As it does occur to me, because I'm aware of what tremendous feats human beings are capable of once they abandon dignity. May I smoke my pipe as well? Please, uh, go and make yourself at home. Now, my job dictates that I must have my men enter your home. conduct a thorough search before I can officially cross your family's name off my list. And if there are any irregularities to be found, rest assured they will be. That is unless you have something to tell me that makes the conducting of a search unnecessary. I might add also that any information that makes a performance of my duty easier will not be met with punishment. Actually, quite the contrary. It will be met with reward. And that reward will be your family will cease to be harassed in any way by the German military during the rest of our occupation of your country. You're sheltering enemies of the state, are you not? Yes. You're sheltering them underneath your floorboards, aren't you? Yes. Point out to me the areas where they're hiding. It's 
since I haven't heard any. Now, the real magic in this scene is that it was achieved just by good acting, brilliant directing, and simple but brilliant dialogue. At the end of the scene, we know who to be afraid of, and we respect his intellect and ability. Votre hospitalité. Il me semble que nous en avons terminé. Ah, mesdames, je vous remercie pour le temps que vous m'avez consacré. Shouldn't have my boy here pull your head off. How about a magic trick? I'm gonna make this pencil disappear. Ta -da! It's it's gone. Another classic intro for a villain, which shows how crazy and how much we should fear and respect this villain, is from the Dark Knight. The Joker. Classic intro. And lawyers wouldn't dare cross any of you. I mean, what happened? Did your, your balls drop off? Hmm? You, you see a guy like me. Freak. A guy like me. Look, listen. I know why you choose to have your little. <clears throat> group therapy sessions in broad daylight. I know why you're afraid to go out at night. The Batman. See, Batman has shown Gotham your true colors, unfortunately. Dent, he's just the beginning. And, and as for uh, the television's so-called plan, Batman has no jurisdiction. He'll find him and make him squeal. I know the squealers when I see them, and... What do you propose? It's simple. We, uh, kill the Batman. <laughs> if it's so simple, why haven't you done it already? If you're good at something, never do it for free. How much you want? Uh, half. <laughs> you're crazy. If we don't deal with this now, soon, little uh, Gamble here won't be able to get a nickel for his grandma. Enough from the clown! Ta -ta 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 -ta. Let's not blow this out of proportion. You think you could steal from us and just walk away? Yeah. I'm putting the word out. 500 grand for this clown dead. A million alive, so I can teach him some manners first. All right, so listen, why don't you give me a call when you want to start taking things a little more seriously. Here's my card. Again, the dialogue is key, but he backs it up with some crazy action. Now we come to the second part, which is telling. How do you tell the audience or the viewers 
that your villain should be feared and should be respected. This is something that is easier for television series or movies that have multiple parts. A great example would be Lord Voldemort from Harry Potter. He whose name cannot be named. We do not speak his name. We were taught to fear this guy for so many movies before he actually shows up. Yeah, we got a glimpse of him as Tom Riddle, but it wasn't really him. The tell was done so well by making the characters afraid to even mention his name. By the time he eventually does show up, we are already scared shitless. Servant. Willingly sacrificed. Blood of the enemy. Forcibly taken. The Dark Lord shall rise again. Of course it helps that he actually does look the part and the whole snake thing is really, really creepy. And as we said before, when they talk the talk, the villain should walk the walk. When you do a tell, the villain should hopefully live up to his reputation. In the case of Voldemort, I think he did, but just barely. Now sticking with telling, and sticking with the snake thing, we're gonna give an example of another villain, but from an anime series. It'd be interesting to see what happens if uh, he should go against Voldemort. I'm talking about the snake man himself from Naruto Orochimaru. My bad, Orochimaru-sama. Orochimaru's introduction has to be one of the most epic and cool ways to introduce a villain and forces you to fear and respect him right away. One of the best ways to tell how badass a villain is is by the reaction of other people. Let's break down Orochimaru's introduction. This is season 2 of the series Naruto. Up until now, we have only seen one truly epic bad guy and his sidekick, namely Zabuza and Haku. It got real, and the Junin Kakashi had to fight Zabuza to end the threat. The Nine Tails was released from Naruto, and he was able to defeat Haku. Basically, Team 7, that is the team of the protagonists Naruto, Sakura, Sasuke, and Kakashi, triumphed over evil by working together. At this point in the series, there is an exam going on with the lowest level of ninjas, the Genin, who are trying to gain promotion. But hey, the main protagonists, Team 7, Sakura, Naruto and Sasuke are fighting against their peers. No big deal. Then they're attacked by another ninja. But there's something different about this one. The way they tell us what exactly is different about this one is what counts. I went through their belongings, found their identification. Ninja from the Hidden Grass Village. All three of them were registered for the tuning exams. They weren't just killed. All their faces... They're gone. Yeah. 
There's nothing where their faces used to be, like they melted or something. No doubt about it. This is his jutsu. Why is he here? What's he doing at the Chunin exams? Okay, I need photos of what these three used to look like. Where are their IDs? Right here, ma'am. So this is the face he stole. <laughs> Had it already happened when... I was just returning your knife. Why, thank you, Grass Ninja. <sighs> We've got big trouble. Huh? Okay, get moving. Tell Lord Hokage exactly what's happened here. And while you're at it, tell Anbu Black Ops they'd better get a couple of convoys to the Forest of Death. Meanwhile, I'm gonna head in after these guys. Now go! Right! He's come. He's here in the Hidden Leaf Village. Notice the reaction of the instructor. How she doesn't even say his name but only refers to him as him. He's here. What is he doing here? The Hokage is the number one ninja. The biggest, he's Dumbledore. The view is like, who is this guy? They don't say his name, and they're calling the Hokage seriously? Who is this guy? In the case of Orochimaru, the show comes almost immediately or simultaneously with the tell. What makes the show really great is that Sasuke, no the main character's rival, has always been too cool for school up until now. He never gets phased. But when Orochimaru shows up, Homeboy begins to freak out. If Sasuke can be afraid, we all gonna be afraid. We need to fear Orochimaru. Now, if that wasn't enough to impress you and make you afraid of him, you're definitely going to respect him when the main hero comes through and his superpower starts to seep out, the nine tails is coming out. And what does Orochimaru do? Eh, he just seals him away and throws him away like a piece of rubbish. Tailed Fox's chakra is released. What an interesting childhood you must have had. The spell that seals him within you has appeared on your skin. <laughs> 
five-pronged seal! You might not like him for messing with your hero, but you will respect him. Another thing they got right with Orochimaru was he had a kick-ass soundtrack. His theme is bad-ass. Scary. Really scary. In fact, he has two themes. One for when he's fighting and one for when he just shows up. That's how bad Orochimaru is. Now, we have one more example of showing and telling, um, but right before that, I'm going to mention one thing. We've mentioned that the appearance is important. Darth Maul, Darth Vader, they really look badass. Voldemort looks hella evil. Uh, but there's one other thing. The name. These guys I just mentioned all have kick-ass, badass names. Darth Vader, Darth Maul. Pretty much all the Darths in the Star Wars universe, the Sith Lords, have pretty badass names. Um, Voldemort, Lord Voldemort, it does sound pretty mean. And even Orochimaru, a tail snake. Uh, Victor Von Doom, Doctor Doom, that is a badass name. It's, his name is so badass. We still consider him one of the most epic villains when he hasn't done anything in the comic books for like forever, you know? He, he just has that name. So a name goes a long way, believe me. Anyway, like I said, we do have one more example of a show and tell. And uh, the name of the bad guy in this one is also awesome. But to be fair, all the characters have awesome names in this movie. Really, really awesome names. It's a movie with a lot of bad guys, but there is one main bad guy. He's probably the ultimate bad guy. I'm talking about Kaiser Sose, and the movie is The Usual Suspects. The show and tell is really cool, and they did it by introducing so many badass characters. But their reaction to THE bad character tells us how badass Kaiser Sose is. I don't get it. Tell me you got the uh, cripple in there from New York. Yeah. Did he mention Kaiser Sosa? Who? Just bear with me here. Who's Kaiser Sose? Oh, fuck. What do you want? My employer requires your services, gentlemen. One job, one day's work. Very dangerous. He does not expect all of you to live, but those of you who do will have $91 million to divide between you in any way you see fit. Who's your boss? I work for Kaiser Sose.
Who's Kaiser Soze? Judging by the sudden change in mood, Mr. Kint, I feel sure the rest of your associates can tell you. I come with an offer directly from Mr. Soze. Soze's father was German. An order. Nobody ever believed he was real. Nobody ever knew him or saw anybody that ever worked directly for him. But to hear Kobayashi tell it, anybody could have worked for Soze. You never knew. That was his power. The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. One story the guys told me, the story I believe, was from his days in Turkey. There was a gang of Hungarians that wanted their own mob. They realized that to be in power, you didn't need guns or money or even numbers. You just needed the will to do what the other guy wouldn't. After a while, they come into power and then they come after Soze. He was small time then, just running dope, they say. They come to his home in the afternoon looking for his business. They find his wife and kids in the house and decide to wait for Soze. wife raped and children screaming. The Hungarians knew Soze was tough, not to be trifled with, so they let him know they meant business. They tell him they want his territory, all his business. Soze looks over the faces of his family. Then he showed these men of will what will really was. see his family dead than live another day after this. He lets the last Hungarian go. He waits until his wife and kids are in the ground and then he goes after the rest of the mob. He kills their kids. He kills their wives. He kills their parents and their parents' friends. He burns down the houses they live in and the stores they work in. He kills people that owe them money. And like that, all right, that's it on episode two of The Treatment. We deconstructed the bad guy. You have to fear him. You have to respect him. Well, at least if they're done properly. If not, we just forget about him. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, follow us on Twitter. Follow me on Twitter, Magic Sama. And uh, like us on Facebook, like Magic Presents. And uh, subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. Catch you next time. Every creeping scumbag that works the street for a living will know the name of Verbal Kent. The cripple, did you see him? The cripple, which way did he go? Oh, he, he went out that way. I know you know something. I know you're not so telling you say something. I'm smarter than you. And I'm going to find out what I want to know, whether you like it or not. To a cop, the explanation is never that You know what I'm getting at, Verbal, simple. the truth. Come on, Verbal, no who do you think you're talking street, to? No arch criminal, no boss at all. Somebody with power. There was somebody who was capable not of tracking us in New York. Not from a Kaiser Suze. You think a guy like this is close to getting caught and sticks his head out? You get no guys from me. Because you're stupid, Verbal. Because you're a cripple. Kaiser Suze. What I want to know is who's the gimp. You know, you know the whole fucking time. Who's Kaiser Suze? If he comes up for any reason, he's going to get rid of me. Sure, Keaton is dead. I can't feel my legs, Kaiser. First thing I learned on the job, you know what it was? How to spot a murderer. You tell me you got the cripple in there from New York. Yeah. He mentioned Kaiser Soze. Who? After that, my guess is you'll never hear from him again. The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. And like that,